thank you everybody for coming, um, especially so great to see people that we've met this week or that we've worked with. Um, and so just to say, as we have our panel discussion today, it's really open-ended to if you have a follow-up question or want to bring something to the forefront, you know, just let's keep it really kind of in the moment and just do that as we come. I'm just going to give a very brief overview of Arbit's Hall um, and then hand it over to our panelists and to you all. And of course, after the talk, if you have any questions, more about Arbit Hall or about the exhibition, we're here. So in 2020, myself, Sim Lutton from Arts Project Australia, and Jennifer Gilbert from the Jennifer, La Jennifer Lauren Gallery, um, with thanks to guidance and advocacy from Katrina Schwartz, uh, we started having these conversations about um, how to make the art world more ex accessible and inclusive, um, especially for artists that identify neurodivergent and intellectually and learning disabled. And then specifically because it was during COVID and we're looking online and discussing everything online, we started thinking about how can we use this tool of being digital as an asset as opposed to it being something that is restrictive. Um, so we started to just think about art at all, thinking and, sorry, it's coming out. Um, <laughs> and really just look at how we could use digital and virtual collaboration as a platform. Also what we wanted to do is we wanted to continue on work that we were all doing individually with supported studios. So Art at All came about with some, initi some initial funding from uh, the ASOP Foundation, the Australian Council for the Arts, and shortly thereafter from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade from Australia and from the British Council. Um, with Art at All, what we're trying to do is we have four strands, and actually Billy, who we'll discuss in a minute, he's part of our steering committee. And one of the things uh, the steering committee mentioned was that it'd be great to have some sort of visual map to explain everything that Art at All does. So, if is anyone is in, I feel, I'm, I'm just have just you not seen the map? Yeah, I, I mean, after our last meeting, I thought mean, if we really had a piece of mind map, Stolominski, <laughs> Um, full disclosure, mine looks much messier than this, and then we handed it over to a professional designer and got this much better version. But <laughs> everybody has a copy of our, of our broadsheet, and that it has a map, a visual map of everything that Art at all does, which we focus on peer to peer collaborations. This first year has been very focused on collaborations between artists with and without disabilities and internationally. One artist based in Australia and one artist based in the UK. We also commission writing. So in the first year, we've been able to commission writing by writers such as Jennifer Higgy and Francesca Gavin to write about artists in studios, really uh, elevating their practices. We also started implementing a uh, curatorial mentorship and then also an initiative called Curating Collections where we pair an artist working from a supported studio with a public or private collection to curate a digital project, which you'll hear more about in a minute. Um, and lastly, um, you know, inclusivity and access is uh, really important to us. So on the platform, we try to make it as accessible as possible, offering BSL options and audio options, easy reads. Well, on the other hand, we're also really interested in being a platform for the wider art world and arts professionals who are interested in discovering and learning about new voices and uh, new artists and the amazing artwork that's coming from supported studios. So without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce our panelists by name and then if they um, are up for just say, saying a few words on the project that you guys have done with Art at All this year, that would be great. So we'll start with Cheryl. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> On the spot, I wasn't. I didn't know that I was going to go first. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I can make a preface if you want. No, no, no. I think, I think, I think I'm good. Um, yes. So I was um, very lucky and fortunate enough to be paired with Tom Roberts, um, an Australian artist who, by all accounts, is kind of setting the world alight with his incredible drawings and paintings. Quite rightly so. Um, and what was so brilliant about the, the whole process, I think, was that I was actually quite nervous about being paired with another artist whose practice I had no idea about. Um, I was kind of just 
in the hands of our Tatao to do the pairing. And so I was really thinking before I found out about the found out found out about um, uh, who the artist was going to be. I was thinking like, what if their practice is like really technical? And you know they've got this incredible I don't know like engineering thing. And I was thinking I just kind of cut and stick images together. Like how is that going to work? But with, what was brilliant and beautiful was that they really Artetal really saw the, the synergies within our practices. So from that moment of being introduced, it was just really easy. It was really easy. I felt really supported. All the language I've mentioned this before, but the language and even in the contract, like things like that, that kind of that kind of ideology of care and understanding that different people work in different ways and this is a new space for, for everyone involved. And so being really mindful about managing those relationships and um, feeling as though you can raise your hand and say, actually, I'm not quite sure about this, or actually, I don't really work that way. It's just, oh, it just takes such a load off. And I really feel like that's, um, I, I feel lucky to have been a part of it, but it really, it, really does feel like that should just be the mode going forward for everyone. Mm. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is uh, the kind of colourful collage digital print work is the, um, the outcome of the, the kind of exchange that Tom and I were um, kind of in, in the midst of, I suppose. It, it, it kind of was like, it felt really quick. Everything felt really quick. like. Oh, and, and easy, um, and uh, getting to know his practices just sort of germinated a whole set of new new things that I thought that I'd closed the door on, which is really interesting. Um, and um, I was just saying to Lisa now, I was I have been um, aware of a few supported London studios just because I used to work at a gallery um, and. Uh, who had previous links with Submit to Love and the redaction space. So I've been quite lucky in that way, but what's been really um, eye-opening is really seeing the kind of network worldwide through this project and um, being uh, yeah, introduced to so many incredible practices and just across the board being inspired in that way. So, yeah. And Sherelle's the artist that Sherelle worked with was Tom Roberts, so he works from a supported studio, Studio A in Sydney. Um, and uh, before John discusses uh, his collaboration, because they're, they're different, so it's nice to see the ways uh, Sherelle and Tom developed a way of working where they sent um, Zoom messages to each, uh, video messages to each other, um, giving the studio visits. And because of the time difference, so it didn't it didn't quite work out. That was yeah, a little yeah. bit of a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they would sort of leave each other questions and give little tours of each other's studios, and then began exchanging um, imagery digitally. That then they were sort of layering on top of one another. Yeah. And um, who is Woody Tiger? <laughs> yeah. So in some ways, the time difference was great because we couldn't have that straight forward conversation. So Woody Tiger was introduced to me as just the name Woody Tiger um, in one of Tom's very first uh, videos. And from that moment, I was just like obsessed. Who um, <laughs> is Woody Tiger? And it felt like forever. I couldn't, I didn't get a, um, I didn't get an answer until the very end where um, it turns out Woody Tiger is uh, one of Tom's very like, best, closest friends who works at Studio A and who facilitates kind of his uh, practice um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of part and part of his development with the studio. So I'm really glad that that's been taken up. But I still am just that there's something about the name Woody Tiger. I'm just really <laughs> satisfied. I think we've all got our own Woody Tiger. <laughs> Yeah, Woody Tiger is his spirit animal. Right? Yeah. Just, yeah. Woody Tiger isn't Woody Tiger. Woody Tiger is the only culprit. Thank you. Um, and then just say, so yeah, the, the works from the peer to peer that are on display here, um, these are sort of edited versions of the of the larger projects, which you can visit, visit the platform and see some of the videos and the kind of larger exchanges. Um, thank you. Um, and then I'll introduce John Powell Jones, um, who did another peer to peer with us. It'll be great just to hear a little bit. Uh, so 
So I'm John. I work with an artist called Matt Robertson, who uh, was with or is with Art Fisco in Australia, um, and we got paired together. I think because we both work a lot with characters, um, and I guess like world building in a sense that we create a environment and then populate it with these characters that maybe represent different things to us. Uh, so we initially met up and were discussing about how we could collaborate by introducing our characters to each other um, and how we could like facilitate a, a space where they could like meet each other essentially. So then we started working on this process of, um, I don't know if you know the game uh, Consequences, so you would write something or draw something, fold it over, give it to someone else, and they'd start uh, the next part of that story or character or whatever it is. Um, we started with that kind of concept where each week we would um, draw characters and a setting, and then they would be sent to me and I would get Matt's setting or environment and Matt's characters, and then I'd have my environment split uh, universe thing mm -hmm. going on. So like they meet and then they both inhabit each other's worlds mm -hmm. and then it kind of like string theory I guess like splits and then you've got these two conversations going on that are linked but also separate. Um, so then it was quite it was a really interesting way of working. I've never worked like that before with someone else where you're you kind of don't know where it's gonna go um, and you only have uh, a certain amount of control over it yourself because the other person can bring something completely different to it. And um, so as well as the environments and the characters, each week we would ask each other questions as well. So then the characters kind of went on this um, self-evolving journey with each other where they were trying to find out a little bit more about each other, as me and Matt were trying to find out more about each other as well. So I guess like the characters were kind of like a loose reflection of ourselves and how we were moving um, but then they became like you know existing in their own worlds as well and finding out about each other in the worlds that they live in and then that kind of uh, developed into this comic strip that's on the back wall over there so it's um, the same con conversation represented across two worlds so yeah them finding out about each other, discussing where they live, uh, how they live, and then becoming pals, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was lovely. It was a really um, great project to work on. Um, I guess like very similar experience, and it, it felt very supported, and um, it felt very, I guess, stress-free. Um, it was something quickly found it becoming like the, the real highlight of my week that mm -hmm. this idea of like oh not only like get to hang out by Zoom again but then um, also like that surprise of seeing what Matt had produced that week uh, and how that would fit together. Um, so yeah it was uh, quite a unique experience really for me that I've had in the sense of it just felt like very easy <laughs> um, and very enjoyable and then um, really happy with the outcome at the end of it as well. So yeah, it was a great project. And you guys did, uh, you powered through the time difference, right? You guys were the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was 8am, I think for us, was it 8am? I think I was still in my pyjamas. And then 7 In bed. 7am Yes. Just saying before, it did feel sometimes on a Sunday night that feeling of having homework at the end. <laughs> 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 it was that moment where you'd be like, I'm sorry, I've only drawn one background, not two this week. Don't, don't shoot me. <laughs> yeah, and like, I guess like, because Matt was so prolific as well, that like he was, um, yeah. 
But apart, like that was like a very, you know, uh, we could joke about it. Um, it wasn't like a, an actual real stress, I guess. But um, yeah, so it was that, that time difference was quite. I guess like initially it felt like, oh, how's this going to work? But then I think it, it really added to the project because we, I think, we wouldn't have got this outcome if we were then meeting up every week and then trying to figure out where the story was going. I think it really benefited from having that space. So like, there's a week in between of trying to figure out what the answers to the questions were going to be, what environment was coming next. And, yeah. It was nice as well because Matt in Australia was a little bit hesitant at first, wasn't mm. he? Because he was like, John's work's a bit scary and I'm not <laughs> sure about it. But then when he got to know more about your characters, mm. And actually, he realised that they weren't scary and they were very similar to how he thinks and his experiences of the world. Mm -hmm. It, like, really worked beautifully together. But there's that moment of, I don't know, John, you know, look at the characters, they've got spiky bits, or I don't know about this. <laughs> like that first conversation, one of the things, he was like, just getting out there, I don't like horror. I was like, that's fine. <laughs> 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 just in case you're wondering. Yeah. <laughs> what are you, can I ask you a question? Can I? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, both of you have mentioned like the support, you know, the idea that you've got good support. And I'm, I, I've reflected on this and I thought, you know, is this, and you've spoken your book said how easy you felt you, you felt <laughs> it was. Yeah. But, and do you think that's, uh, there's something in that, in that, the support you got from Art Hotel, or the kind of the dating agency role that they played <laughs> in the process was actually, you know, key to it? To enable you that because otherwise you might have been dwelling on these in your head and mm -hmm. it might have been less expressive artistically. It's definitely, it's, I think it's something that appears, it appears to me to be wo woven so thoughtfully and carefully mm -hmm. right from the beginning. So, um, yeah, definitely. I think it's, you know, it's, um, uh, what would be the word? I think it's telling that both of us have mentioned how easy it is. Mm -hmm. So what has not been easy in previous encounters mm -hmm. with other organisations. Um, and, you know, um, I think there's definitely some small things that could be implemented to make uh, projects, or like art projects and art commissions feel supported. Um, but it goes, you know, it's just a human, mm -hmm. a human kind of look at how, how do people, how do we interact and how can we create together? Just because it's, you know, we're the artists doesn't mean that it's not a, cre it's a whole holistic kind of creative endeavour, right? So mm -hmm. people facilitating that are in that process. So it really is crucial that we have this human element of like understanding relationships, understanding how people work. How differently people were, yeah. um, what things can, what small things can be put into the bedrock of like building these relationships that can make things um, really fruitful and beautiful and enjoyable um, and high quality as, as well. Mm -hmm. Get the most out of people. But yeah, and yeah, I think the digital was not a uh, an obstacle. Because of all of this other background work, um, whereas it really easily could have, could have been. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> if you're speaking to one of the studios, because um, I know that also with the time changes and with working with artist facilitators and everything, it can be a lot of work to do these collaborations. But then exactly the, one of the points of Art Hotel is, is that we're trying to exactly use this digital connection as a great access point and as a really positive thing. And things that gives artists an opportunity to connect internationally, you know, as opposed to it just being something to, that got us through COVID. And I wonder also, because we, Lisa and Jen and I have talked a lot about this, in setting up the peer to peer, there's a structure, like there's a framework there to work within, but there's not a, there's not a specific outcome to what that peer to peer will result in, because it depends on how the artists come together, how they communicate. And so I guess there's in building within that to also make mistakes mm -hmm. and you know and to have 
have enough flexibility that if something something were to go off track that way, that you can go off track that way and explore it because there is good trust mm-hmm. there perhaps. Yeah, definitely. I think like it was uh, for me. like we had paired you up because we think it would be great for you two people to meet that was first and foremost and then it'd be great for you two to chat about life but there wasn't really any idea and now we expect this 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 and this from which can sometimes i think in my experience stifle a project because mm-hmm. then you've got that worry of like i may be underperforming or like mm-hmm. whatever it is whereas with that it was much more about i guess just having the space to just allow something to just to see where it goes, basically, mm. without that pressure of like, oh, we're, we're like running behind on getting X amount of work done for that amount. And yet your outcome with Matt was quite polished yeah. in the end. <laughs> like, it's very, um, like, it was so I cracked the whip. <laughs> <laughs> I did uh, it. <laughs> you know, whereas Emily and Sandra very much took such a different approach mm. to their interview that was responding to different themes. Shifting gears away from the peer to peer, our uh, curating collection. Um, Billy is an artist for Submit to Love in Dalston, so I will let you explain a little bit about Submit to Love. Yes, yeah. Submit to Love supports a studio in Hammersmith, uh, um, East London, part of the Edway, Edway East London, which is a, an organisation that supports people affected by brain injury. Um, Anyway, so yes, Art et al. I sit on the steer, the UK steering group for Art et al. And um, I was asked to do this curating collection. And as I mentioned before, a bit like a cinder hunt on the fourth of the this was standing. It's recording you. Oh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so as I say, it's a bit like a dating agency. Who are you going to see? <laughs> and, and, and so I got teamed up with um, Monash University Museum of Art in Melbourne, and um, it's named Book of Katrina for a reason. I'm looking at Katrina. Oh, are you? But not when we were working on the project. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it now, I'll be far back. No, that's good. That's the longest I've had. Anyway, so I got teamed up with them, and they showed me, well, I see part of the fantastic, I think it's about two and a half thousand pieces in their collection. It's a university collection, um, post 1960s, so it's mostly contemporary art, but it's all Australian. It's all Australian art of all kinds. So there isn't much that you can't, you know, from Australia that you can't see in this collection. And so I looked at it and it was just mind blowing. I just, I, I, I just completely felt at home right away in this collection. And so putting together a collection of like, in the end, how many gems? 24. 24 images. It was really quite hard. And you know, I was really saddened to leave some of them out, but eventually I did, and I linked it the way I, because I, I, I'm thinking like, how do you, well, how do I talk about this collection now, other than trying to sound intellectual, which I'm not. So I linked it to a 1997 camping trip I did in Australia with my wife Jane. Is she here? Yes. Yeah. She'll be able to tell you all the. So in 1997 we did a camping trip with two friends in Australia, and. Um, we went right down the middle of Australia and then round to, to I've got to go with that one, round to Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, so it was down the middle and round, round to Sydney, um, round Melbourne, Melbourne, Sydney. So um, I linked it to all my first impressions of Australia, this, so this far away land that you've only ever heard about. I only ever heard about it in a TV program called Skippy when I was very young. Does anyone remember Skippy, the bush down your room? His famous detective kangaroo, which is not, 
So I linked it to this camping trip and sort of all the impressions of, of the landscape, the environment and everything. I linked it to pictures and, and I wrote a, a kind of brief sort of essay and sent it over to the um, everybody at Monash. Well, who was it? it was Muma. Muma. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can I say Muma? Yeah. I'm yeah. not using acronyms. acronyms. <laughs> anyway, so I sent it to them and they... Uh, they, they responded to it and looked at their collection and said, oh, what have we thought about this, have you thought about that, thought about this, and so they drew out loads of different, more images. So we went through hundreds of images, and I eventually pin, managed to pin it down to 24, and so that is what is in the digital, digital collection, um, and that is what you'll be able to see. And it, it, all I can say is thank you very much to Art et Al for putting this together, and to Muma for being so generous. Because I, I, as soon as I picked this idea of I'm going to write an online camping trip and your pictures are going to illustrate it. It's a very gonna, entertaining story. And, and they, I thought they're going to say no. They're going to say no chance, mate. But they didn't. And so, and so, that was, so I got away with it. Anyway. <laughs> so where can you see them on the Art Hotel website? In, a, in about a week. In about a week. <laughs> really? Uh, project is to be released soon. Yeah, that's it. Coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> Coming very soon. Uh, and then just uh, to speak briefly to the curating collections in the same way that John and Terrell mentioned these sort of different outcomes, uh, Billy was our, will be our second completed curating collections. And it, again, it's really interesting to see the different approaches the artists take. So our first one was an artist, uh, Michael Tomakaras from Arts Project Australia. And he worked with uh, Cranford Collection, which is a private collection here in the UK. And his approach was more looking at connectedness during COVID. He also selected around 20 works, but uh, divided it up into three categories, connectedness, humanness, and I can't remember the third one off the top of my head, but he had sort of an environment curated it in three sections. And then his thoughts were very much about um, having speaking and having conversations with the curator, Ann Pontney, discussing how um, you know his selection process was very much uh, scale didn't matter, um, you know everything is 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 this size. Where for Ann, who curates it physically, you know scale makes a big difference. So then they were also talking about this difference of you know accessing work digitally and physically. Where Billy and Declan did this great narration about with works reflected off of his journey. So it's just great to see the different the different approaches. It was just a great fun. It was a dream project. I mean, I, as I say, I don't believe we could get away with it at all, but I did, so here we are. It was fantastic. Thank you, Artis Al. My pleasure. Um, so I was going to ask the panelists kind of some larger questions about connecting during COVIDness, but I just thought before we do, if anyone had an initial question, feel free. Yeah. Is there something from your experience in this project at any point, um, could you identify one thing that you might take forward into future collaborative work mm. uh, or that you hope you could, that will be present in future collaborative work and that's for each of the panellists? Go for it, Ben. It's actually what I mentioned before, and I'm both, I'm both John and Cheryl, about the idea that, you know, part of the stress of thinking about it too much, don't think about it too much, and, and you know, the things that you, that are going to drag you away from the thing that you really should be doing. So, really, that is the key. It's a type of working, and um, I think, you know, we've talked about the meaning of the word collaboration, and the meaning of the words co-production, and and other things like that. and it's how you work is important. Mm. How you work together. So that's the thing that we've got. Everybody's got to do a lot more thinking about that mm. because the way you've been working together in the past just don't work anymore. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, it's funny actually because I hadn't really done very much collaboration in yeah in terms of my visual art practice at all up until the peer-to-peer -peer project and then after the peer-to-peer -peer project it's just 
collaboration is central. <laughs> um, so I think something has been unlocked, <laughs> and it's re which is really exciting. So yesterday, uh, me and Alicia have been sort of having these conversations about I have a sound therapy sort of um, practice. Uh, Alicia is like uh, coming from a shamanic practice background, um, so we're kind of like working together. And we did our first thing yesterday. Um, but that's the, the uh, that's been like a long conversation, um, and we're friends before that, um, so it has it has felt very kind of like it's fine. We're friends. There's a kind of pre-existing relationship there. But I think with the peer-to-peer -peer, um, collaboration, the way that I see collaboration um, has felt. I think it's taken the pressure out of it. I think just the, the process of kind of, of let's let's meet and get to know and then trust that something will happen out of these conversations and it doesn't necessarily have to have um, a big shiny ribbon on the on it and be completely resolved. Um, I think that's the that's probably the thing the theme that runs through lots of the things that I'm kind of currently working on and have worked on since um, peer to peer. So yeah, it's definitely um, kind of, oh, yeah, it's, it's had a really big impact on how I work. <laughs> uh, I guess for me, um, something that I found quite uh, different or beneficial from other projects was like chatting about um, briefly earlier where Mark at the beginning said, I don't like horror. Um, I guess in previous projects, being quite reluctant to talk about the um, the personal elements behind the production of the work or the meaning behind it for me, rather than say like the social political meaning of it, but like the actual personal meaning, and then I think opening up about that slightly with Matt allowed the project to, I guess like um, maybe like he trusted me a bit more or something. I don't know, but it allowed the project I think to develop in a way that maybe. It I guess taking that from it, maybe just being a bit more open about the, um, the reasons behind the work or about the practice. A nice question related to that in collaborating with digital is, it struck me with your work that there is a real integration of the worlds. Mm. So how did like the digital, in terms of like, was the digital collaboration in some ways they, you know, we think of digital world as maybe being inaccessible, but was there something about enabling you to both get in each other's worlds in a closer way because it was digital? Does that make sense? Yeah, maybe. I, guess, I, I think with digital, it, de it depends where you're. It depends where you are within that world, I guess, because I think in some as in some aspects, um, digital can be like really accessible because anybody that takes away that for me personally that human stress of having to go somewhere for example mm -hmm. um, or for having to be in somewhere with somebody discussing something and everything else that comes with that like the journey getting there how like I don't know where the toilet's going to be like wh whatever it is it's all going on whereas if you strip that all away and it's like we're just working digitally so you're in your studio somewhere that you feel comfortable and whatever else and you're just sharing this work I think can make it um, like weirdly like much more accessible even though you're completely separated from each other so I, I found this especially in this project like I felt that we had that one scheduled hour you know exactly that that's what when you're going to meet on the week so you've got that timetabled you know when that's going to be and then from that is up to you to figure out how you're going to develop it and put it together. But then you know, wherever you're going with it, the next hour you've got that, uh, the next week you've got that anchor to come back to. So you, even if you're not at a space where you've finished what you're working on, you're going to get some feedback, you're going to have a discussion. You're going to have how, how long did you, what's the whole period you, you met once a week? Once a week for two months. Two months. Yeah. Just over two months. So it was. It was um, was it only two months? 
Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe a bit longer. They both caught COVID during the time, so it was a nice experience. Nice to chat about that experience as well. <laughs> like, how did you feel? Well, I was feeling like this. How did you feel? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I guess that, that's another thing, actually, the COVID thing. That it's come at, like at a point of like a really weird time where you're kind of getting used to this idea of being separated. So again, mm-hmm. having that schedule of one hour of like interaction was like I guess come off the back of a very odd uh, couple of years so um, that in a way made it feel like more accessible and unaccessible in a way. Um, and you, you were both in I guess like places where you feel safe so he was always in his bedroom mm-hmm. for the zooms wasn't he and you're in your studio where you're surrounded by all these things that make you feel safe so you were both in like safe environments when mm-hmm. you were on the calls and feeling relaxed and like there was no pressure to dress up or look in any way. It's just like, I'm here, this is what, I mean, I'm in my pyjamas, you're doing this, you're doing this. Like, it was a very relaxed setup that we had going on and there was no pressure to do anything or... And maybe because it is in COVID, coming back to what you said, Billy, about, you know, the ways that you access things and the way that you do things now and access art projects or the way that you set those things up can't be done the way that it always was. And perhaps this allows a space to say the way that collaboration looks, which might have looked a particular way, mm-hmm. could be anywhere, really. Mm-hmm. You can make it happen whether you catch up on Zoom together or whether you send videos or packages or, um, yeah, mm-hmm. sort of make Yeah, from a digital point of view, I had not considered the kind of, I had not really looked at the flip book. I don't know whether anyone's seen flip books, but the flip book is mm-hmm. what the curating collection uses. It's more not much like an art catalogue where you swipe your mm. tablet and you basically go through this magazine of look of, of the of the of the, of the catalogue. And so that was not something I'd really sort of seen the power of. And um, it really is quite powerful. It's very kind of like close and it, it puts the user in control so they can flip back and forth. Because if you're working in magazines, I noticed I noticed when Jennifer picked the um, the magazine up over she kind of uh, came to it from the back rather than the front. So in a flip book, the person who's using it can actually is in complete control. And so you might have habits for magazines, but what are your habits for a flip book? And I think it's normally sequential. So anyway, I was just sort of thinking about that, the power of that medium, which is a part way between what would look like a foot and feel like a print thing. And um, it is totally digital. So um, that's another thing I took away from the, um, the experience. That's on a platform called Is- Issue? Issue? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah, there are lots of different flip book mm. platforms you can buy, but and I've seen some newspapers done like mm. that as well, because you basically can then just tap into the story. And yeah. Well, I guess it's also with the Architectural site, as we think about the different ways to access things for every project, we want to be able to present it in a variety of ways people from all walks, walks of life can access different parts of it or all of it if they want to and it might be through visuals or it might be through publishing some of those videos that you took um, yeah I think thinking about um, we had a digital conversation with uh, a, a writer at one point about yeah. using and I think we used the word digital residency which I think was like a really I think succinct way to talk about almost all the collaborations, the writing, the Curatorial, um, curatorial mentorships, the curatorial collection that are here, you're here in the sense that it is digital, but it is like a residence in the sense that you can come and go, you can set your own structure, and you know the outcome, much like most artists and residencies are, with a very open ended. You know, it's not looking for a specific, yeah, sort of, sort of outcome, or you know, we might do a curating collections next year where a flip book isn't the right mode. Um, our curatorial mentorships, we've only completed one on our website. We uh, worked with the curator Stella Sedelli, and she worked with an artist, um, Eden Menta. And through that process of working on how to curate a digital project online, we really wanted to facilitate, you know, what Eden saw the project was, which ended up coming with a a soundtrack. She found um, the Star Trek intro to be something that she goes to um, in the evenings as like a anxiety calming noise. 
So we um, you know, put that on the website for when visitors click onto the website. She also wanted to make sure there was an accessible drawing element. So on top of working with artists, we also had a live draw option. You know? So we really wanted to be there to facilitate you know, what ideas are sort of coming you know, to the foreground. Um, I think we also were kind of curious to know from you guys um, if, um, in terms of your projects with Artist Hall and or kind of working digitally other during COVID, kind of plays into Katrina's question, but has it impacted your kind of creative practice at all, kind of going forward? Um, I, th I was already working, trying to figure out ways of, uh, I guess, explore digital more and integrate um, ways of working that didn't rely on like a physical space. Um, so I had already been developing uh, for an exhibition I'd done last year, I spent a couple of years developing characters from that exhibition into a uh, interactive computer game that was um, freely accessible on a platform called Roblox. Um, so this idea that you could go to a physical space and see the work, but also if you didn't want to go to that space, you could then um, like visit that world essentially and meet the characters by uh, going to an alternative space online. So I've been really thinking about that digital so like um, choose your own adventure but digitally in like on forums and what have you and like bringing that element into um, an art practice um, and I think that I think it, it worked really well those ideas like with Matt because that was like essentially choose your own adventure um, and I think there is scope for that to be even like explored even further like you know there's no reason why they what's on paper there couldn't be like a, a digital thing that you mm -hmm. interact with online. Um, so yeah, I think there was already like kind of ideas in there of like how to develop the digital element more. Because the other side of my practice is very, like the thing that I enjoy doing is very physical. It's very, uh, like relies a lot on like making and textures and color and what have you. Um, yeah, <laughs> that character there. So like that's, a, uh, but then I've also got like a, a very short attention span, so I will move from one process to another. Quite, you know, like have like a, a, a character, like a, a real life character being made, but then making that in a digital format or doing a, I don't know, like a ceramic piece of it or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, I think this project, like there was already seeds there, but it definitely um, gave like room for them to like, I guess be explored and develop more, which is something that I'm well, currently trying to figure out a way of developing more and more. I think that idea of free, a free platform for stories to develop, but isn't maybe you like set the world, put some law, isn't L-O-R-E of like what happens in that world, but then people are invited to create their own characters to mm -hmm. develop their own Um, yeah, my, um, drawing, like I said at the beginning, I, it's, but it, it's really funny because I actually marked my trying hard, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I still have a bit of a block about um, actually making time to draw. So uh, yeah, I've just been thinking. I've been thinking of a lot about drawing since this collaboration. Be just because, I mean, I, Tom's drawings and paintings are just so good, <laughs> they're so good. And I was always, I was already thinking about text um, anyway, and I've been, yeah, thinking about, thinking about um, sort of image text combinations and how I'm able to 
um, start drawing again because when I, I when I was a kid I was drawing all the time, all the time on loads of different things, much to my mum's, you know, real hatred really. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, yeah, I've kind of I've lost that. I, I, I'm now I'm in a new job and um, I'm kind of I'm facilitating workshops with young people and drawing is seems to be like a really big thing that um, certain young people really want to get into, which is really, um, which is really great, and I'm up for the challenge, but also there's this whole thing of like, I haven't drawn in eight years, what am I going to do? I'm supposed to be the knowledgeable one, <laughs> I don't, do I even really know what I'm doing? So I don't know, I'm kind of caught, caught in this um, sort of teacher, student, master, novice um, space at the moment, and um, even though I've come such a, you know, like I'm a professional artist, there's still, I would have thought by now, I would have gotten to a point where, um, like, I would just embrace it, but there's definitely this kind of really funny thing that's, it's just really, um, I don't know, like, interesting. Imposter <laughs> syndrome, but also, like, that, the whole thing of getting it right, mm -hmm. being good. Mm -hmm. If I was talking to myself, or I was talking to one of my, you know, like, one of the young people that I work with, I'd just be like, I would just say, have a go. But I can't say that to myself. Mm. Um, and that's just ridiculous. Mm. So, but yeah. it is that sort of a historic thing. Mm. Uh, in the training of artists in the past, drawing and get, getting it right in drawing yeah, yeah. was central. Yeah. Uh, um, but now, Oh, it isn't at all about drawing, but, uh, uh, but perhaps we need to go beyond that. The art isn't just about film or, or other things, or collage, it, it's about drawing as well. But what we want to say, it's okay to n not get it right. Yeah, or just to make a mark and mm -hmm it not be, you know, like the most perfect thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be about rendering something uh, as, you know, as true to how it appears in in reality. And what's but, important is how it feels, exactly, not how it is. Exactly, exactly. And what's sort of maddening for me and what I, yeah, I'm just learning as I'm here talking to you is the resistance that I feel about be about Get it, about getting it right and knowing that it's not about getting it right, it's about just making time for, to do it. But even in that, mm. that kind of like intellectually and what it feels like, there's this disconnect. <laughs> um, so yeah, drawing and, and drawing for the sake of it, I really hope to um, embrace in my, in my practice. Yeah, particularly for me, it's, I mean, I draw, I use devices, I use an iPad, I draw on my phone all the time. I have a stylus in my pocket now, and, I'm, <laughs> and I don't stop drawing at any particular time. I'm, but I don't kind of, I mean, I, I'm, and I'm not, that's, I'm not really scared of machines. I am the person that will press the button and see what happens. <laughs> but I'm the good will kind of, and so I, I, I'm, 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 fairly, I'm fairly fearless. But I, I kind of, what I've found during lockdown is I'm using the drawing for such to create, to move on to the physical. So the drawing is the preparatory stage for me. So I will sketch things and I'll compose images that I like and I'll keep working them through digitally. Then I will go, I've recently done a lot of stitch work. So I'm now, I'm now creating patterns digitally that I will transfer and I will create, I will create the physical thing then. So I kind of don't start, as the, the physical side is not really the starting point for me. The digital side is the starting point. So that's where I go on, on my iPad and on my phone, really. That's what I do. The bigger thing that came out of the whole experience of lockdown for me was this, how the studio worked. My studio is a supportive studio and I'm a studio artist. So and our, our studio sprang straight into action and recreated the studio environment online 
for us to do at home. So we had the home studio. On Friday, we had a home studio where we'd all gather together and tackle a structured project. On Thursday, it was the art cafe where we would all just hang out and do whatever we wanted to do. So we had kind of, the studio was very key in responding to the crisis to support its artists. And that's, that to me, was the biggest thing that came out of it, how, how well they did it. That's interesting to occur, and this is on a tangent, but also working in a studio in Australia, Arts Project Australia did the same thing. And when you look at all the supported studios, in some shape or form, they seem to respond very quickly. And the idea that working digitally as being a barrier sort of fell away out of necessity. And this whole other world has opened up that's maybe also taken, and it has for a whole lot of other artists and arts professionals, and maybe it's just taken some, some people of that were not, some people the were not, were not, were not, were not online people anyway, but they were, they were supported separately. They were, they were, you know, people delivered materials to them and they supported them. But the studio responded very quickly and in ways you could not imagine, that you could not predict, but they were just so quick and I thought, it's like, how, how did they do that? It was like a bit of magic to be honest. But uh, what I would say is Billy, a following from that, uh, now with come out of COVID, that no longer happens. I know we're a bit sad about that. Mm -hmm. There's good things that we can do there. What was the best thing then, Chris? What would you find? Home studio, you, in, in the time that everybody would take to do one image, <laughs> Chris would do about six, and he'd read them off like Bob Dylan's going through them all the time. But you only had a short time to do images. Uh, uh, and you, uh, we well, did it for a year and a half every week or so. So by the end, you got into the habit of doing things quickly. And that was good. So I'm aware that we have gone over time. Um, so um, if anyone has any final questions or everyone has a bit more time, we can pose one final question to the panel, um, which will be me then, I guess, yeah. <laughs> which is uh, your projects with Artitol, um, has it changed any perceptions you may have had about disability and or um, had an effect how artists that identify as neurodivergent, learning or intellectually disabled are positioned in the contemporary Big question, maybe short answer. <laughs> <laughs> short answer is, I, don't, I don't know very much about the contemporary art world anyway. I'm kind of just a fellow who hangs out in an art studio and does a bit and, you know, gets away with it. I, I don't really know what the contemporary art world is, yeah. to be honest. So. Yeah, fine. Uh, I was really lucky enough to, a couple of years ago, have been involved in a project with an organisation called Venture Arts. Mm -hmm. So I had spent like a long time thinking about that and that kind of opened up a, um, an interest into that area uh, that has like stood being yeah. like, yeah. So like when this opportunity arose, like it was a really exciting one to be able to, I guess, um, like get involved again yeah. in that kind of so yeah, it's something like I'm, I guess, like actively very interested in. Um, it hasn't changed my perception because I, like I mentioned before, I've, I've worked um, sort of very kind of um, loosely with um, so bits of love studios. I have kind of worked more closely with um, action space and loosely and project artwork. So. I've, I've been aware of some UK brilliant um, supportive studios um, like who, yeah, I'm kind of very fortunate to have been, but I think what's really unique about this project, well, what I see as unique anyway, 
um, is the curation aspect. So like, um, and what's really important and, you know, sort of politically in that act of occupy, occupying that advocacy and activism space where we're artists, we're artists. That's first and foremost. The work comes first, interest in practice comes first, and how that work comes to being um, is second is secondary and you know the whether that whether that artist is neurodivergent or you know has come from a supportive studio that is you know that is um, that's important but the work is way way more important mm. um, and I think you know from being involved with the summer summertime gallery yes um, uh, exhibition that that's what is exciting to me is the pairing so being able to be um, in conversation with artists who who are very different to me who have come from like a, 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 you know different parts of the world have a completely different kind of experience of the world and occupy it in a, in a different way is is refreshing and that is our that's our practice in its kind of I don't know, like really amazing kind of, yeah, con opening up conversations that I would never have had before and facilitating that conversation, which is, has been so rich for me. Thank you, everybody, for coming.